turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, page 888. If you have a church Bible, page 888. Daniel chapter 4. One of the things that we're going to be looking at this evening is the idea that sin is not just about rules that we break, but is about the state of our heart as well. And in Daniel chapter 4, you have a great narrative story about King Nebuchadnezzar and the state of his heart. So I'm going to, I'm going to read all of Daniel 4 for us so that we get the whole story if you've never heard it before. Um, and then we can have just a, a bit of time of quiet and reflection on it and a bit of a time of open prayer as we confess our sins to the Lord. So Daniel chapter 4, if you don't know uh, where we are in Bible history, Daniel comes towards the end of the Old Testament as he is part of the group of people who have been taken from Jerusalem to exile in Babylon. And Daniel uh, has been whisked off from Jerusalem to Babylon and finds himself uh, in the employment of the king, of King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. And uh, here we read about Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions, I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots be bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by the messengers, the holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for, t for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. 
Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty. This is the decree the most high has issued against my Lord, the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken away from you. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals and you will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right, all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. What a brilliant, brilliant story teaching us the folly of pride and the importance of humility. This great king acknowledges that the most high is God. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion is one that endures from generation to generation. I think just for a few moments in a little bit of quiet, why don't you think and ponder on the ways you and I, you can do it for yourself, I'll do it for myself. How we can be as dumb as Nebuchadnezzar and think in the pride of our hearts that we've done the things that we've got in our own life. And maybe we can echo King Nebuchadnezzar's prayer in our hearts as we pray and acknowledge that the Lord is King and he does what he pleases. Let's just have a few moments of quiet in this busy day that we might reflect on who God is and what he's like.
Heavenly Father, we want to confess that we are not that dissimilar to King Nebuchadnezzar. We don't have the great earthly kingdom that he had, but we do think of ourselves as being at the center of our own lives. We do think deep down in our hearts somewhere that it's our actions that matter more than yours. That it's our strength that will build success. That it's our ideas that we need to come to pass more than anybody else's. We look around at our lives and think, we have built this by the might of our power and for the glory of our own majesty. Gracious God, please forgive us and have mercy on us, we pray. Help us to see, like Nebuchadnezzar saw, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. That actually our kingdom, the things that we are doing, matter far less than who you are and what you are doing. That all of our lives in every part of their detail is in your hands. Lord, we want to pray that you would help us both individually and also corporately as a church to acknowledge who you are and what you've done and that what you are doing matters more even than what we are doing. Please, we pray that might knowing this bring us peace and rest and joy and security and confidence for the future. We pray that we might enjoy acknowledging who you are and confessing our pride. So we thank and praise you for all that you've shown us in your word and especially for the forgiveness that you extend to us in the Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Father, we do want to ask that you would help us this evening. Um, we're probably a little bit tired after things going on today. Maybe we're already anticipating tomorrow. Uh, but we do want to take seriously this opportunity and make the most of it that we might learn well and listen carefully to what your word says. So bless us, we pray this evening, for our good and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have been taking us through what I've called like true foundations, some basic, simple doctrines from God's word that are foundational for us in our Christian lives. So as we look at God's word, it, this is because God's word is everything that we need to know as a Christian. Okay, so God's word is sufficient. It means that I can ask it questions about areas and topics that I want to understand and what it teaches me in its totality is going to be everything that I need to know about that topic. Does that make sense? And so what we're going to be looking at this evening is the doctrine of sin. What is sin? What does it mean to be a sinner? Now, sin is a very Christian sounding word, isn't it? We have doubtless used it before, we use it all the time. But what does it mean and what do we mean by it? Well, with the person sat next to you, I want you to ask that question. What is sin and why is it so bad? Okay, what is sin and why is it so bad? Just turn to the person next to you for a few moments and scribble down your ideas on that and I'll get us back together. What is sin and why is it so bad? Right, okay. I'm sorry, I'm not giving you long, but I want to make sure that we make it through this evening. So, what is sin and why is it so bad? Now's your time to shine. Disobedience to God, yeah? Ray. Something we do which breaks God's heart. Yeah, interesting. Why did you like that so much, Ray? I would never have thought of that. Yes. So true. Yes. It captures a relational element to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Rebellion, yeah. Rebels against God. Okay. Not trusting and not believing. Yeah. Missing the target, yes. 
Yeah, so falling short, yes. Yes, transgression stepping over the line. Yeah. Okay, any action or thought that keeps you away from the love of God? Yeah. Okay, yes. So there's a sort of personal offense to it. Yeah. So it's not just a wrong action, it's the offense of it. Yeah. All right, universally imputed to us from Adam. We will get into Romans 5 in a little bit, Guy. Yeah. Uh, every now and again, I think, why do I do open question time? And then I think, no, it's okay. It's okay. Everyone will. It's fine. Yes. So um, actually, this is, this is helpful. Sin is not only something we do. In the Bible, actually, sin is a status that we have, isn't it? As sinners. We stand... So it talks about two realms. We either stand in Adam or in Christ. And so, like Guy is saying, that actually our standing, our status as sinners is given to us because we are in Adam by nature and not in Christ. Yeah. But we will do more of that in a moment. Thanks, Thanks Guy. Yes. The sort of the corruption in our hearts, sort of like you could describe like a, you know, like a shopping trolley that's always going, doesn't matter how hard you try, it's always going that way. That's what our, our hearts are in, are sort of inclined towards evil all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What would you, what do you mean? Yes. I don't know whether that's iniquity, is it? Turning away. I don't know if the root of the word. Yeah. Okay, there you go. I refer the honourable gentleman to Mike's greater wisdom. Yes, so it could be referring to specific acts. Okay, now listen, let's get, let me try and round some of those ideas into groups. Um, there are loads of different ways we could do this, but I want to try and point out to you three Bible ideas about sin. And um, in order to try and make it memorable i'm going to use something that we used to teach to the to the children but the three ideas are this the first is that sin is idolatry okay so i want us to see together from god's word that it, that sin at its heart is is tearing god from his throne and replacing him with someone or something else so, so before sin is an action or an activity it is a uh, a dethroning of god so idolatry. Secondly, I want us to see that sin is pride. Essentially that in that ripping of God from his throne, there is also essentially a kind of a self-exaltation. We are like Nebuchadnezzar. Look at me and all these great things that I have done. It's, a, it's what Martin Luther calls it, a sort of turning in on ourselves, an inward bent towards thinking mostly about ourselves and being mostly self-interested. So sin is idolatry, sin is pride. And thirdly, I want to see that sin is law-breaking. Sin in the scriptures is a legal problem. God writes the rules, we break the rules, and breaking the rules is sin. Now, a phrase, I don't know whether you've heard this phrase, but we used to use it with the kids as a simple way of defining sin. And I think they probably didn't realize how profound it was when we were teaching it to them, is this, that sin means, so S-I-N, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules yeah shove off god i'm in charge no to your rules s i n sin shove off god i'm in charge no to your rules and so i think that captures this idea that uh, sin is idolatry it's shoving off god it's pride it's i'm in charge and it's law breaking it's no to your rules so hopefully then you'll be able to remember that and you'll be able to remember some of these bible ideas so let's start with shove off god Here's the biblical idea that sin starts with a rejection of God. Sin is relational. It's the rejection of who God is, the removal of him from the place that he deserves in our lives. And Romans chapter 1 pictures it like that. So turn to Romans chapter 1, or I've printed it out on your handout so that you're not spending all evening dancing around the Bible. But Romans chapter 1, verse 18, reads this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth 
by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, you look down at those verses and you think, well, what is the revelation of the wrath of God? God's wrath or his judgment or his anger at uh, the wickedness of people is being revealed. Where is it being revealed? Well, actually, it's not really until the end of that section that you get the revelation of God's wrath as you get this list of all the evil behaviors of people. From verse 29, they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderous, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventing ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. That is where you see God's wrath. But sin itself in Romans 1 comes before that. The list of offences are at the end. Before that is this suppression of the truth. That although, verse 19, God's nature is plain, because, verse 20, it's been made visible in all creation, still we exchange what is plain about God for something else, verse 23. And that's, that's what's wrong with the world in Romans 1. That's sin in Romans 1. It's the idolatrous removal of God and the replacement of him with someone or something else. It's shoving off God. It seems in verse 23, doesn't it, that the specifics of the God replacement vary. It could be human beings, it could be birds, it could be animals or reptiles. But the theme seems to be that the replacement is something less than God, obviously. A reduction. Someone or something that we can control and that we can manipulate. Now let me show you as well that this idea comes through in the parables of Jesus. It, it, turn to Mark 12, and um, again, this is on your handout, but... You might want to turn to it in your Bible as well, just so that you can see it in its context. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. Let me read to you this parable. It might be familiar uh, to you. Then uh, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, but they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. The tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest Jesus, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Now, in the parable, obviously, this is God is the owner of the vineyard. The tenants are the Jewish leaders. And he has sent his servants, the prophets, to come and collect the rent but they have treated them shamefully, beaten them and sent them away, some they've killed. And then he sends his son, the Lord Jesus. And what do they say? Verse seven, this is the heir, come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. It's interesting, isn't it? That the, the tenants, what is, what is the motive behind what they're doing? Jealousy, yes. Sorry? Yes, so they, they are, um, the, the Jews are jealous of Jesus, yes. He'd spoken the parable against them. 
It seems, doesn't it, that it is a recognition of who Jesus is which sparks off their hatred. Do you see that in verse 7? It is the fact that they see that this is the heir, that they say, come, let us kill him, because they want the inheritance for themselves. Their recognition, possibly even subconsciously, that he is the son of the king means that they choose to kill him. In other words, Jesus in the parable is saying to the Jewish leaders, you have built into yourself such a deep hatred of God himself that if he was to turn up in person, you would do all that you could to kill him. It's astonishing, isn't it? It's astonishing. You know, we we wonder, what would we do if we met God? Well, the New Testament witness tells you that if you met God, you would do all you could to kill him. You would do all you could to kill him. Why? Because you're a sinner. By nature, we are sinners and we hate the Lord. And it's interesting, I think the way that the parable of the tenants is told, you are meant to see that the judgment on sin is just righteousness, isn't it? You're meant to read it and go, of course the king will do that to the tenants, because that's the right thing for him to do. And so that is the wickedness of sin, isn't it? That it says, shove off to God. It says, ah, here's the heir. Let's kill him. It was Dick Lucas who had this phrase. So Dick Lucas is a, was a preacher in the central London. He said, proof if you need it, that so deep is our hatred of God, that should we knowingly meet him, we would try to kill him. Shove off God. That's at the heart of sin. Now, just with the person next to you that you were talking to earlier, I want you just to think, what are the implications of that? The applications of it? Any questions that you might have flowing from it? Just think about that for a moment, and then I'll get us back together just to think about the implications of that. Okay, let me get you back together. What do we think are some of the implications of this? Anybody want to start us off? Yeah. Yeah. So the wages of sin is death. Yes. So uh, Romans chapter six. So um, it's interesting, isn't it, that actually, as we see what sin is, the the wages of it seem more natural, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. It's not just that you've broken a few rules. Yeah. Any anybody else? I think if, if people, so the Lord does restrain some people, even non Christians, from going. Sure. Uh, but we have to see it as being God's restraint and not. Yes, interesting. That's in, yeah, yes. Yeah, so God, the the Bible teaches a thing called common grace. The idea that God's restraining sin in people's lives so that people aren't quite as bad as they could be. When when you hear the doctrine of original sin, that doesn't mean that everybody is as bad as they could be, because God is graciously restraining people's sin. But actually, this you know, learning this does mean that we understand that people left to ourselves, we would wander way, way off, wouldn't we? Yeah. I think one of the, the challenges of sharing the gospel in our culture is that it's quite difficult to persuade people that they're sinful and that they need a savior, because we talk about sinful behaviors that people aren't always that bothered about. Sex outside of marriage, not really that bothered about that. Not attending the worship of uh, a good local church, really bothered about that either you know working on the lord's day don't really care about that either um low level stealing and lying really have a conscience about that either but here we learn that actually before any of that what you have done that is wrong is that you have taken god from his throne and removed him and actually you can see in concrete ways where we've all done that coming you know anything else Should we keep moving on then? Okay, let's move on. I'm in charge. I'm not really, don't quote that out of context, okay? I, I'm in charge. Shove off God, I'm in charge. This, is, this really is closely linked to the previous statement, but it's the idea that the, in the removal of God, even with the installation of idols in his place, really sin is a turning inwards. Martin Luther 
is uh, great discovery is that sin is the sort of the redirection of love that was meant for God towards ourselves. So that sin is, is not just at what we do, but the way our wills and our desires are ordered. That basically most of the time we want what we want for ourselves. Uh, one author has summarized uh, Zwingli and Augustine uh, like this. For Zwingli and Augustine, so Augustine is one of the church fathers, Zwingli is a reformer. Uh, sin was no more than self love. Sin consisted in valuing oneself over others and conceiving of others and of God in terms of one's own self. It was to conceive of God in terms of one's own experience as embodied and physical, and it was to measure others in reference to oneself, to enter into social relations out of self-interest. Conceive of God in terms of one's own experience, measure others in reference to oneself. Sin is the turning in on ourselves. Having taken God from the throne, we bend inwards. Now, if this is right, then it means, doesn't it, that sin is more than just breaking the rules. In fact, if this is right, I think it is, it can be sinful to keep the rules if you are keeping the rules for a selfish reason. Now, I think that's exactly what you find going on in the New Testament quite often. So turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, and this is what we find Jesus talking about in Mark chapter 7. Let me pick it up in verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He, that's Jesus, replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. Now, keep your eyes on that passage. The, the Pharisees are, are picking Jesus' disciples up for their failure to wash their hands, not because they have any concern for their hygiene. It's not that they're worried that they're going to get a stomach bug from eating with uh, unclean hands. They are concerned that they are ceremonially unclean, that they are not following this ceremonial cleanliness tradition. But Jesus comes back at them with a quote from uh, Isaiah in verse 6, saying that they are full of external obedience. They say the right things, but still at the same time, their hearts are far away from God. Notice that, that it's possible to honour God with your lips whilst being far from him in your heart, and so worship him in vain. And the example he gives to them is the Corban law. Uh, the Corban law was this way of you giving money to the temple to ring fence it. Yeah, so that you could say, listen, I've got, I've got 10,000 pounds of savings here, but I don't really want to be giving that away to my mum and dad when they're in a bit of financial need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to the temple and they're going to put it in the Corban account. Now, the Corban account is a ring fenced account so that it's technically devoted to God so no one can access it. So that when my parents come to me and say, oh, listen, we can't feed ourselves. Have you got any money or, or our mortgage uh, payments are due? Have you, have you got some money for us to pay? And you go, oh, no, I'm really sorry. I've got no money. You go, what, what about that money that you had? Oh, no, 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 that's Corbyn, which means you don't have it anymore. And so what they were doing is they were using a religious sounding law. It's like a kind of 
religious ISA, yeah, so you don't have to write it down on your tax return. So yeah, we don't really have those savings. Yeah, so they were they were they were putting it over there so that they didn't have to obey the law. And Jesus says, listen, you are you are hypocrites because you look good on the outside, but inside your hearts are far from me. It's interesting the word that he he uses in verse 13, thus you nullify the word of God. It's literally you basically you are de-lording the word of God. You are dethroning God's word from that place that it's supposed to have above you by your tradition that you've handed down, and you do many such things as that. Do you see this is this is sin? It's not only it's not only pushing God away, it is putting ourselves in the center and saying, listen, this is all about this life is all about me. It's all about me. Now, okay, that's the second point. So shove off God. I'm in charge. What are the implications, applications, and questions flowing from that? Go for that for a minute or two uh, with the person sat next to you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. Someone help us out. What are the implications, applications, and questions flowing from this? And for those of you on Zoom, I am really going to try and repeat the points so that you get to hear them because otherwise you don't get to hear them. But if I get them to hand around a microphone, Nobody wants to speak into a microphone. So, um, right, anyone want to start us off? Don't all go quiet now, because you were all talking a moment ago. Because it shows that sometimes keeping principles can actually keep you a distance from the relational side. Right, so sometimes <laughs> sticking firmly to principles can keep you away from your relationship with God. Do you want to expand on that, Mike? With Most a... likely, if you, if you take yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, you can have a list of rules. Um, yes. I, uh, let me try and expand on that, Mike, and see where this is where you were going with it. I think it is possible for us to make uh, poor assessments of our spiritual health by marking ourselves against a tick list of obedience that we think you need to do as a Christian. Am I reading my Bible every day? Oh, yes, I am, tick. Um, have I prayed this morning? Yes, I have, tick. Uh, have I been to church at least four times this month? Yes, I have, tick. Have I been to the prayer? Yes, tick. Oh, I must be doing brilliantly as a Christian. But actually, if it is possible to do all of those things for wrong reasons, then it is possible for me to be doing all of those things and not actually growing as a Christian, isn't it? Um, and so I've got to be really cautious about that approach to understanding sanctification. Yeah. If, if what's happening in the gospel is God's rooting out sin and has given me a new nature that loves him and wants to live for him, I should be finding that I'm doing those things out of a heart of love. Sorry, that loves the Lord. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, you could think of all number of examples, couldn't you, of different ways that that would trip you up. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else want to share what they were thinking about? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It is possible to do the right things for wrong reasons. Yeah. I wondered if um, we live in again in a culture, don't we, that celebrates pride. I mean, literally celebrates a thing called pride, and also is really enthusiastic about uh, self-interest and individualism. You know, we love to get what we want and to be who we really are. Right? Those we literally those are those are things that we are celebrating and think are really important. If I understand this rightly, both of those are sin, aren't they? You know, this idea that I am. The, the biggest and most important thing in my life is to express who I really am. Is it, is it really? 
I don't, I don't think that's right from the Bible. Is the most important thing in my life to be, to be proud? No, I, I really don't think that is. I think that was Nebuchadnezzar's downfall, wasn't it? Not his success. Yeah. Okay. Shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, written just down the road, uh, says this defines sin like this what is sin sin is want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of god what was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created we all talk like this don't we secretly the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they're created was their eating of the forbidden fruit so sin here is the breaking of a rule god gives a rule sin is the breaking of that rule now this is clearly biblical isn't it but let me just work through it with a couple of passages for you 1 john chapter 3 verse 4 everyone who sins breaks the law in fact sin is lawlessness romans chapter 5 verses 13 to 14 to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. Here Paul's point seems to be that the law is given in order to give a list of charges to people's sin, so that the law is given, so you go, okay, you, you've told God to shove off, you've said that you're in charge, how can we see that? Well, you've broken this law, 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 and they are added up. And even when that law is not there to count the list of charges, nevertheless, still death reigns, which is a demonstration that sin is real. And actually, Adam broke a command, and that's how sin entered the world, because Adam was told not to eat, and he did eat. Is a pattern, therefore, of... Um, the one who was to come, who is actually turns out to be Jesus, who obeys and gives us life. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You dishonor God by breaking the the law it's interesting in those verses sin is definitely the breaking of a rule isn't it but there is also clearly something ahead of that before which the breaking of the law comes which leads to it it does seem to be that these hearts turned in on themselves that sh tell god to shove off that are only interested in themselves and in pride that works its way out in the breaking of god's law Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7 that it is hearing the law that calls out of him rebellion. It's like, it's like we, we, we want to break the rules. And so when we hear a rule, we're going, oh, that's an opportunity to disobey. Let me give you a really trivial example about what I was like as a child. My, my parents, if they would put something hot on the dinner table, they would say to me, what do you think they would say? You would think they'd say, don't touch it, wouldn't you? Do you know what they used to say to me? Touch it. Go on, Steve, touch it, touch it. Go on, it's really hot, touch it, touch it. Why would they say that? Because they knew if they said, don't touch it, what would I do? Touch it, why? Because I'm a rebel who loves to disobey. And if you give me a rule, it's given me something to rebel against. And that's what it's like with God's law. Because in our hearts, we love to disobey. We love to turn in on ourselves. And so the law counts sin and uh, classifies us as lawbreakers. Now, just to finish off and to move on, I want you just to think with the person next to you now, in what way does the Christian now sin? So all of this is talking about sin as a category, doesn't it? As a problem in the world, okay? In the world, we've told God to shove off. We've told God that we're in charge and we've said no to his rules. If you're a Christian this evening, in what sense are you still a sinner and do you still struggle with sin? No, I'm not asking you to open up your heart and tell the person next to you about all the things that you struggle with, particularly, you could do if you wanted to, but just in terms of where are you in that description of sin? 
Okay, let me call us back together. This is, I think, is really, really important for us to understand, okay? And I, I am slightly reticent about introducing such a huge topic just with five minutes to go in our Sunday evening meeting. But does anyone want to help us out on what does, in what way does the Christian now sin? Charleston. Yes, we are imperfect. Yes. Yes. So we still do things wrong because there's still a way to go. Yes. Let me try and let me try and explain this as clearly and as simply as I can, because it's really, really important. When you become a Christian, a decisive one for all time change happens. You are transferred from the kingdom of Adam to the kingdom of Christ. You are dead to sin. You are alive to God. You are no longer saying, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. You're saying, I love you, Lord. I want to live for you in your glory. But although we are free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, we still live with the presence of sin in our lives. And in a, in a sense, it's an alien experience for the Christian to sin because it's against the new nature that we have been given. But Martin Luther describes it like we're, we're dragging around a dead man with us who's still kicking and twitching. And we are still at times doing things which we know are wrong. So it's interesting, isn't it? The Lord's Prayer teaches us as Christians to pray regularly for forgiveness, not because we're still kind of, oh, are we going to be saved? Are we not going to be saved? We are saved. We're in Christ, but we're still doing things which our old nature wants us to do. And that's, I mean, that's the description in, in Romans chapter seven. To give you an illustration uh, that's borrowed from another preacher, okay? Imagine two fields separated by a road down the middle. In this one field here are the sinful sheep, mastered by a sinful shepherd who is leading them all astray. And they're all wickedly behaving and doing things out of the sinful desires of their own heart under the command of the wicked shepherd. You are rescued from that field, taken across the road and brought into a new field where the grass is green and lush and lovely. But what you can still hear while you're in that field is the shouts of the wicked shepherd from the other field. And every now and again, you think, oh, well, I might do, you might do that. That's what it's like, isn't it? We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, but somehow still we just sometimes hear the voice from across the field and do what we know we shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Anyway, there you go, a doctrine of sin, which is really important, isn't it, as we try and explain the gospel and as we try and live lives which are increasingly submitted to the rule of Christ. Let me pray and we'll sing as we close in Christ alone. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for what we've considered and thought about this evening. We praise you that the Lord Jesus has saved us from sin in all its horror and ugliness. Thank you that we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Thank you that now, by a work of your spirit, we no longer say, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules, but we say we love you. We long to live for you. We want to say yes to your law and your rules that we might live lives which please you. Help us to do that for the sake of your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.